children of the world, parents of the world, this is for you. I'm Rowena. And I'm April. We are best friends and moms to five young athletes and sisters to Olympic champions. We have a mission to inspire our kids and your kids through the stories of champions. Who am I? I'm a champion. Who am I? I'm a champion. Who am I? I'm a champion. Welcome, champions. If you have not heard about a woman named Caroline Buchanan, it's your lucky day. We are so excited to share her with you. On the champ side, she is an eight-time world champion. Three of those titles are in BMX, bike racing, and five are in downhill mountain biking. What? (laughs) Um, She is the world's first woman also to do a front flip on a mountain bike. She's kind of crazy. She's represented Australia in two Olympic Games. And on the human side, she has been through a little bit more than your average person, learned a lot, and she loves to share with future generations the lessons and to pay forward the belief that, you know, we all need to be what we're meant to be. So, Caroline, welcome. Thank you for your time and being with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm actually quite excited to chat with you. I'll tell you a little story. I think it was maybe three years ago, I was at a downhill mountain bike race with my little boys who do racing. It was the US Open in California. And I remember seeing this woman and there was something special about her. I felt it was like not only her beauty and strength, but there was this confidence that I just like to call the queen vibe. And I said to my husband, I was like, who is that girl? And he's like, what? You don't know who that is? And you're from Australia? That's Caroline Buchanan. She's a legend. (laughs) And so here we are full circle and we're going to talk about life and mind. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. I didn't realize we'd cross paths. That was one of my favorite events. They'd had a trick jump and a step up. And I actually think I got taken up to hospital that round so it wasn't it was like a pro and con I love that event but it was yeah pretty gnarly at the same time oh wow I didn't know that oh gosh <laughs> yeah they had this um, like, crazy stuff competition and they don't run it anymore because there was too many injuries um but yeah the jewel slalom the pump track the best trick comp uh, it was so fun Yeah, so good. Gosh, well, let's just go back to the beginning. I know we'll have lots to talk about, but um, what about your childhood? What was like three-year-old, four-year-old Carolyn like? What were you into? (laughs) Yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm an Aussie girl. I lived in California actually for 10 years, so spent a lot of my life between the two countries, got a lot of friends in California. I can't believe we've crossed paths over the years, but yeah, I grew up in a small town called Canberra. I basically knew by the time that I was three that I was this little adrenaline junkie athlete kid of the future. My brother used to, we've got these like circular clotheslines in Australia and I would hang by my legs from that and he would spin the clothesline around and yeah, we'd obviously go up to like craziness and my mom, she took me into a uh, video store when we were super young and I think this was like the prime example of when she knew that they were going to have an athlete of the future and how to help shape my career and how to help me and you know just be those parents that were so invested and we went into a video store and she said at the time that we were looking at Disney movies and I would have just started gymnastics and She said, we're walking along and I picked up this Nadia Comaneci Olympic Perfect 10 routine and it was all about this documentary on her. And she just said that I was adamant that we needed to get it and she got it and thought she's not even going to watch it. And at three years old, she would just put it on and it would just play in the background and I'd dance around and like practice my little gymnastics and yeah, I was just mesmerized by by it. So I think from then it kind of realized like my parents put me into every sport I possibly could be in. Um, I was really drawn to like those individual sports quite early though. They sort of knew like, okay, she's really this individual athlete that likes that success on her, likes that failure on her. And um, yeah, that was kind of the roots of like where my sport and my pretty early, like nine years old going to world championships um, started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Did anybody in your family bike or is that was this all new for your parents to get you into this like were you the driving force behind it all well I remember I was doing like tennis taekwondo soccer like all the different sports and we drove past the BMX track when I was five and my brother 
Sam, he decided that he wanted to do it. And my dad jumped on the BMX as well. And all of a sudden it became this like family weekend club sport thing that we did. And yeah, like for some reason, like just BMX, I loved it. I was hooked to it. I had this massive crash pretty early on straight away. I was eight years old and I like got these death wobbles down the start hill, blew out all my chin and had stitches. And, you know, my parents were like, okay, maybe that'll deter her up. <laughs> it didn't. So yeah, that was sort of how the journey began. Oh, that makes sense. That little uh, story about not being deterred. Cause I've, I've researched you a little bit and you've had quite a bit of adversity in your life or in your family. And I love it when you talk about how rather than kind of getting you down, it sparks something in you. Um, yeah, can we talk about that a little bit? I know there's some crazy things that happen in your family when you were young. Yeah, I definitely think that there's two avenues you can take things and resilience is formed by obviously going through tough times. And yeah, for me as a family, like we, when we were nine, I started traveling international to like world championships, Paris at nine years old, Argentina at 10, Holland at 13. So every year we'd like go to the world championships and um, yes, I started competing quite early and I knew like, all right, I really want to be this like BMX athlete of the future. It wasn't an Olympic sport. There wasn't females making any money out of it at the time. So at that point it wasn't a career path, but it was, you know, that drive for me. Yeah. And I think we were, when I got to 12 years old, we actually lost our home in this big Canberra bushfire and we managed to save our bikes. So it was this real like turning point as a family that we kind of lost everything we had to our name and we, our house burnt down. My grandma's house burnt down. We had the national titles, I think three weeks later. So we took our bikes. We still went to the national title with them. My brother then had this like gnarly big accident and he broke his neck. Um, luckily he was quadriplegic, paraplegic, and then regained feeling. So he then went through this like massive injury and setback. Um, he was the one that got me into the sport and he didn't continue with racing. So it was this other real like pinnacle point that I was a 12 year old girl and I was like, okay, like I've just literally lost everything. Um, I've got my bike and then now my brother that's got me into the sport has had, you know, this career ending injury do I really want to take this on? Like it was quite a big life choice at that age. Um, and I ran with it. Yeah. I was like, yep, like this is what I want to do. And um, I think that was a huge resilience building part to then, you know, whatever then stemmed in the future. It was like I'd really built that foundation of belief in myself and controlling like the emotions and controlling what I could control really with in myself. So <laughs> kind of been an early road early on and it set me up for the future did that end up helping you even though as hard as it was do you really do you feel like it also helped you um just be grateful for being able to bike and all that kind of stuff like how did you get through that did you have things that really um helped you that continue that like tools that you continue to use today to help you through stuff like that yeah no it definitely didn't it's um I think the champion podcast, like it's perfect because when we went through all this and I think we moved houses and we're in like an apartment at the time and yeah, there was a lot of like transient things in my life at that point. My dad had printed off this champion podcast and he'd put it on my like, not champion podcast, this like champion script and it was like on my window. So every time I'd like brush my teeth or like walk past it in the morning, I'd always recite it and it basically said like, I'm a champion. I believe in myself. I have the will to win. I surround myself with winners. I'm cool, positive, confident. I have courage. I never give up. I'm willing to pay the price of success. I love the struggle. Like I love the competition. And I vividly imagine what victory will feel like. And this was this like script and I'm 13 years old at this point. And I would just like read it every day. Yeah. And it's like ingrained now. So, you know, I think that my parents were kind of like always trying to just give me like little tools. And at that point we didn't know about mindfulness and affirmations and all these things and how much they can influence. Um, but for me, it was just this little champion's creed and I got you know, I'd listen to it. And anytime, you know, just play in the back of my mind um, when I was competing or training or yeah, that real belief system. 
this is, um, it's not surprising that you've become who you are, actually, <laughs> hearing this. Um, yeah, let's talk about your parents for a second. I am yeah, trying to put myself in their shoes. Like, I mean, just the fact that they didn't limit you because of their fear. I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. And if I had a son who broke his neck and kind of changed his life, would I continue to support my daughter? You know, that's a huge, did they, tell me about that a little bit. Do you know what went through their head? Did they talk about it? Was it hard for them? Yeah, you know, we, I guess we didn't really like discuss it. My parents just asked me the question, you know, do I want to continue racing or, um, there was a company at the time that built neck braces that became a real thing in motocross and mountain bike and BMX. So I remember like, I just increased the amount of padding that I wore, but then that also then decreased over time and neck braces got taken away. And just the things of like strength and conditioning became more important, like having a healthy, strong body. Um, yeah. So I think we kind of went down that avenue, but yeah, for me, I think my parents, we just, I don't know, it never really came up as an option. It was just like, all right, how do we deal with it? Or, you know, how do we move on to the next goalpost? Um, yeah. What um, what order are you in, in with your siblings? Are you middle, youngest, oldest? Just an older brother. So, yeah, most action sports oh, girls cool. I've really found, they all have like this older brother that kind of helped get them into – action sports so young and I think yeah my, my brother was the one that he was that real sort of if he jumped out of a tree I jumped out of a tree and since he started racing I started racing um he's now a real estate agent now and yeah I have a little niece um so yeah he's obviously healthy and loving life but I was sort of the one in the family that decided like I really wanted to go on from that national level to then go on to the world championship level and when I was 15 that was when I discovered mountain biking and it was actually, I lost a bet with a friend and I had to go to a mountain bike race and he had to go to a BMX race. And it was the best bet that I ever lost because um, it really, <laughs> yeah, to start mountain biking and have these like be a dual athlete doing BMX and mountain bike. I think it's, it's really helped me with not only my skill sets, but like mentally to have the longevity of a really long successful career to jump between the two and have those little resets and you fall in love with one, you fall out of love. It's like this like love sport relationship. And yeah, I was able to kind of dance between the two over the last 10 years. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Cause I wondered, um, you know, I know BMX and downhill mountain biking people from the outside who don't do them might think like, Oh, it's just biking. They're both the same, but they're completely different skill set, right? Yeah. So mountain biking's, Confusing. Most people always say downhill. Um, the world titles that I won in mountain biking were actually four cross. So it's like for you, oh, that are okay. familiar, for you that were familiar with like border cross and snowboarding, it's really similar. Um, so four people out of the start gate, moguls, slalom turns, jumps, and it's like that head to head race. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the mountain bike category and then the BMX racing. So they're kind of similar, but I have competed at world level in downhill as well. I think the top five was my best result in downhill. Yeah, so everything from pop, oh. <laughs> downhill, tricks, BMX, race, like, yeah, I've jumped around quite a few yeah. different cycling. So you just love the challenge, it sounds like, like most of the two champions out there. You just, like, do it for yourself to push yourself. Is that kind of it? Yeah, and I guess, you know, the love of it, the reward of it and, um the fact that quite young, sort of my parents were like, you know, this career doesn't exist for a young girl to be a BMX Olympian. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to be something that you can't see of the future, you do learn, you do, do learn to love the process and to fall in love with like those small wins daily. And that was, I think, like a big part. I was 14, 15 and Lane Beachley, she was one of my mentors back then she had her aim for the stars foundation so at 14 you know she called me up and was like hey like you've won one of my scholarships I just want to tell you that I believe in you and you know I'm here and those words really I think changed at 14 15 you know I'm like do I want to take this as a career what do I want to do you know I'm starting to get boyfriends I'm in school like all these distractions and um so she called up and she was like hey, you know, 
I've won seven world titles and I totally believe that you can beat my, you know, number and like I'm just here all the way for you. And I was just in disbelief. Like naturally that lifted those limiting beliefs in me to say, okay, like, if I can win one, I can maybe win seven like her. And, um, yeah, so she was a big part of that foundation and why I then started a scholarship program for girls called Buchanan Next Gen. I love it. Wow, that's amazing. It's so it's so cool to hear. We've actually um, heard that in other interviews, interviewing champions like you, where at a young age, they had somebody that really believed in them. And that made a huge difference for them in their future of their sport. And it's so cool. And that's one of the things why we love this podcast so much, because it might not be directly, you know, saying to one specific person, but I do feel like there are a lot of kids that have are lucky enough to have that or have parents that are supportive like you were, but there are kind of the other side of it too. So for them to have this as a resource to say like anything's possible. I mean, you you show that you show that because you're defying, you know, the odds being not only a champion in two sports, but also the longevity of it. So um, talk about that, actually, like how, how do you what do you feel has been a big part of your success for the longevity of your career? The longevity, I definitely think doing BMX and mountain bike. So to all those little athletes out there that maybe you love tennis, or you love taekwondo, you love soccer, or whatever your sports are, maybe you love both continue doing both. A lot of athletes specialize so young and become so conditioned to only that sport, only that skill set, and they don't have the diversity. Uh, I really am now seeing Olympic athletes that are crossing over multiple sports. I think they're the ones that adapt quicker to like not only change in life, but maybe change in your own sport. So for example, BMX racing, once it became an Olympic sport, they brought in a huge three-story start hill, bigger jumps. It became from being this like more power sport to a really skill-based sport. Um, that shift really like split the girls in half, the ones that continued and the ones that didn't. I think the mountain biking that I was doing at the time, the fact that I was hitting these bigger jumps in mountain biking and I was already like, exposed to that I was able when that door opened for BMX racing to go into the Olympics I was able to take those skills and I was ready and I was prepared so yeah those athletes young I think the biggest thing is just continue doing your two sports and that'll give you the options and longevity um I also started really young looking back in the gym so not that I was like lifting weights, but I really wanted to train. <laughs> like, looking back, my crazy parents, they were like, this girl. Um, I really wanted to train. So I was nine or 10 around that age. And there was my dad had been doing these circuits at this local Southern Cross Club gym. And I was too young to really even walk through the door. But somehow we managed to get this PT lady and she ran these circuits and I was able to just join in. So I'd just like go on the runs with people and I'd come back and, you know, like I wasn't really allowed to like use the machines, but I could do body weight squats and little plyometrics and, you know, so I wanted to be in, involved in that. So at nine, I was already starting there. We had a, um, we had a pathway as well, which was called the ACT Academy of Sport. It was our state that led into our national, which fed into the world. And at that time, you, I think you needed to be about 17. But at 13, I really wanted to be involved. So, um, yeah, my parents actually basically paid for me to be involved in this program that I was too young for. And I was around like-minded athletes. And I think when you surround yourself with like-minded people, you know, you evolve so fast too. So already at 13, I was entrenched in this ACT Academy of Sport and learning the foundations of how to lift um, and how to do those you know, Olympic lift movements with just broomsticks and the super basics. Um, so, yeah, I think longevity, it was also like starting quite young in a lot of these foundation movements that led to where I am now. Yeah. 
I um I love that you mentioned this. We actually had a listener reach out on Instagram and ask that exact question. She has an eight year old skater, and she's like, "What age should they start doing like training?" And I was like, "You know what? We're going to ask some of these people." I, I said the same thing. I was like, "Body weight stuff. You can learn. You can start whenever." Um, this is awesome. Cool. Okay. What other tools and tricks do you have? Let's talk about the mental side. I know you must have a whole bag of things that you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I definitely recommend like, for, yeah, for those young kids, those parents, like those foundation movements of how to walk properly, how to squat, like how to do plyometrics, how to just bound upstairs. And, um, that was really what we sort of worked on quite young. Um, and it meant that when I did get to like 16 and I could start lifting weights that I was ready and I had those like movements. So yes, start early and start those. Um, mindsets, I would say there was a few different tools when I was younger. I would always reach out to different psychologists through sport. And what really resonated with me young was I would have this like debrief. We all know like the old school, like, pyramid of food <laughs> it's like it's gone now kids don't recognize it now but um basically I have this success routine so I'd have this like little triangle and after every single race I would like draw in it and basically inside the triangle was what worked and then outside the triangle was what my brain was saying so what was some of the like messages or like my positive feedback or my negative self-talk so like what was my brain saying and then it was like really just uncontrollables that also sat outside. So, you know, I'd go back to early World Cups when I think I was like 18 at the time. And yeah, it would have things like um, some, I think there was like a girl's crash that maybe like got in my head or, you know, it was raining or it was windy or, you know, Maybe someone was like bullying me on the team or like whatever it was. I would like put that outside the triangle and then within it, it was like, what was, what was I saying? What was my focus? What was my warm up? What was my like routines? Um, and I just evolved this like success pyramid over time. So I definitely recommend that. It's like this like success recipe, put what works in, put what, put what works out of it. Um, and over time, you start realizing, like, yeah, what you need to say to yourself, what you how you need to warm up, and um, yeah, that I think as I got older, really turned into this um, board. So I have a vision board, which when I lived in Australia, I had one. When I moved over to America, I had one. Um, so to all the kids out there, start your vision boards like early. And what mine looks like is I have my like weekly training. So I put up there and then I have my like goals written as well, which I'm a visual person. So I like having those like big Olympic rings. I like having the logos of the events. So like visually being able to see it. And then oh, I have like the, now the content goals as well and things. So sponsors and the brand and the endorsements. So what content's coming up? What, like, Ford Australia, I've got five videos, I need to do this. Oakley, like, I need to do X amount of videos, five posts, whatever it is. So I have, like, the content side, the goal side, my training side, and then I have, like, this slay five, which is, like, five absolute non-negotiables that I just know I have to, like, life do that week. So at the end, basically Sunday of every week, I just, like, go to my board and I'm like, all right, slay five let's start here might be taxes or like boring adult stuff now but um have my slay five and then obviously like I can put my program in put my content in and just kind of like look at it all and for me that vision board has also become this like accountability mirror and I think that's a massive thing life gives you not what you want but who you are and so it's a real reflection of once I got this accountability mirror, I was like, what am I doing? Am I staying on track? Am I sticking to my goals? Am I doing, you know, supporting my sponsors? And that was this real accountability check-in. So, yeah, definitely to all the kids out there, like mm. start those vision boards now, today. <laughs> and you do that, do you do a new one every Sunday or just you change that one part every Sunday? 
I'm all getting technical with it. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, like, the main goals stay. They also shift as well. So when things like COVID happened, well, that just board got wiped. And I was like, let's restart because I'm only going to do, like, a two-month goal thing. Um, so, yeah, sometimes the goals shift, but for the most part, they're always there. And they're everything from life goals to sport goals, long-term, short-term, Um yeah, the main thing that changes is that that weekly layout plan, when I'm going to the gym, when I'm riding, what I'm doing, you know, and the social life side of it as well goes in and just those slay five, sort of the five tasks, that changes every week as well. And do you feel comfortable enough sharing with us some of your goals that you have on there now? I think everybody would love to hear. <laughs> well, my recent goal was I just went to Germany um, for this Audi Nines competition, which was the first for women to be involved in. And my goal was to go over there and land a world's first female front flip for mountain biking. So, yeah, that was actually on my goal. So when I go home, I think one of the boxes was mountain bike, free ride, and, like, just elevate because um, – I just missed out on selection for the Tokyo BMX Olympics only four months ago. So it was a very first fast turnaround. I'd rewiped my board only four months ago and kind of gone, all right, now I'm full-time mountain biking. That chapter of BMX is closed. So, yeah, when I get home, I'll literally tick off this, like, mountain bike free ride elevate box. And it was just like, I really want to elevate into this world. Um, And then it was the front flip at Audi 9 so that gets a big tick <laughs> um yeah you did it some, yeah yeah I mean some of the goals that are on there now um I would love a workout clothes sponsor like I've never had a workout clothes sponsor so manifesting that and putting it on the board uh that's one of them that I love and yeah I mean there's financial goals riding goals trick goals um yeah I've got a French bulldog so I think one is like I'm studying him out. So, yeah, <laughs> breeding my French bulldog. Like, they're just all an array of goals. Yeah. I love this. I cannot wait for um, my boys to listen to you talk like this. I think a lot of kids, no, serious, this is huge. This is, um, I think a lot of kids look at their heroes and they look at like the physical stuff they do and they underestimate really how hard you work on the inside as well. We have this saying, like, champions aren't born, they're made. And just listening to you talk, I'm like, no wonder she is who she is. This is, yeah, this is genius. Yeah. But okay, I love, so like, you got the vision well, board. So for all these kids, it's like once you have a couple of these tools, it evolves and they get stronger and they get more powerful and, yeah, through your ups and downs to constantly check back in um, with this board. Like, yeah, a few people have asked, I put on my social media maybe six months ago, like some actual images of it. And my one that was in America was actually, it was a bit of black plastic. It comes in a roll from Walmart. <laughs> and so basically it's like I just drilled this like big board to my wall and then I had these white chalk markers. And so those white chalk markers would fill in this board and then I'd just be able to wipe it, put post-it notes yeah, to be able to get creative with it. So anything from a whiteboard, bits of paper, or, yeah, something like that from Walmart works. Um, what about, I, I love how you talk about fear. Um, can you uh, can you chat with our crew about how you deal with fear and what you say to yourself and what you do when it comes up? Yeah, fear, well, it's your best friend and your worst friend. Um, I've had yeah, I've learned to form this like good relationship with fear. It's what obviously keeps your body alive. It keeps you safe. It's that nice little reminder that when I'm dropping in for example, a world's first front flip, that fear talk always comes in. And I think growing up, I would have absolute meltdowns. I remember like crying in my room being like, how am I a national champion? Or how am I like, so successful, but I'm still scared. I'm still afraid. I'm still having these fear moments. Like, I think I really beat myself up quite early going like, why? Like, I you should just be over this hurdle. But fear never goes away. And it's one thing that you can't fight. You can't really change. You've just got to learn to, like, work with it and recognize it and then 
be able to like use it to your best advantage. So, for example, um, when I was in Germany just these last few weeks, dropping in, so it was the morning of when I wanted to land this front flip and I practiced it at home to an airbag. It was on a much longer jump. And the one that they had set up in Germany was tall, but it was very short. So it was actually, I hadn't practiced for that. I hadn't practiced to start my rotation really early and I knew that I was going to go long and potentially land deep. So we got everyone on board. There was 30 athletes, but about 100 staff in this quarry. There was GoPro filmers. There was drone flyers. There was all the media broadcast in the world was there. And um, so I'm like, all right, I've got to, like, put out my goals over on now. Like, I hadn't mentioned it. So I was like, um, we had a little team meeting that morning, and I was like, what's everyone want to do today? And I was like, oh, I really want to land a front flip. So then, boom, all of a sudden, all this attention gets drawn to me, and I'm like, going into this like fear state oh maybe I don't need to do it this morning like sorry guys um but then yeah everyone we prepped up the jump we got it ready everyone's ready for it and when I dropped in that split second that five seconds of courage moment that changes whether you step into that unknown and achieve this goal or whether you don't that moment of five seconds of courage The last thing I always say to myself is I have this like little affirmation and it's Caroline, you're extremely talented, smile and just let it shine. And that's always been this like reminder to myself to go like stop, like take a deep breath um, and yeah, literally smile because I think once you outwardly show that smile, it changes the whole dynamics of your body, your mindset, your outlook. And then, yeah, just to like let it flow. And I knew that my body knew what it needed to do. I just needed to let it happen. So, yeah, I drop in and the walkie-talkie, it's like, Caroline Buchanan's about dropping for a world's first. And I'm like, okay. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so that, moment, that was what was going through my mind. That's, like, how I dealt with fear. And five seconds later, I've landed it and just had that belief in myself and screamed and went nuts and everyone's stoked and, yeah. <laughs> That is so powerful. Like, can you imagine? I just can't imagine. I love it. I mean, that five seconds that there is an amazing book that I'm sure that you've probably read, but about that, it's just basically like you just have to, you know, five, four, three, two, one, and you just do it. And you're just explaining how much, you know, but there's some science behind that, right? Like in that five seconds, like you have to do it within that five seconds. So it's amazing how you have even like a process of what to do in those five seconds. We'll talk more about, um, cause you were just kind of mentioning it about having so much. Um, I don't know if you feel it as pressure, but like when you were explaining that story, I felt like, oh my gosh, that seems like all the people looking and the cameras and the expectations like that to me seems like, whoa, is that a lot of pressure or are you just kind of used to it? Or do you, how do you deal with all that? Yeah, well, those are the external pressures I think ultimately most athletes and everyone the most pressure we have on ourselves is that internal pressure it's you know the pressure on ourselves to want to do it or the expectations that we have those external pressures they can be really fun and like really powerful if you allow them to be so those are the moments you've got to smile you've got to go oh my god all right just like you know embrace it I think coming back a little bit to like the fear side of what we just spoke about for me in that moment it was that positive affirmation but when I was younger it was actually a real visual tool I used to like when I was learning pro straights or triples these like big jumps um I was 14 I remember like I would just go through these like waves of like I'd be like literally having tears running down my face as I'm pedaling into this like jump that I my body's saying you don't want to do and I'm going I do want to do it um and I would visualize fear. So I would literally go, all right, thank you, fear. Like I can see what you're doing. I can know that you're trying to tell me to not do this right now and protect myself. But, you know, I really want to. So I would grab it and I would like pretend I'd put it in my pocket and I would like pedal into the jump. I'd be like, all right, you're coming with me. Like we're doing this together. Let's go. So putting it in my pocket was what worked when I was like 14 and I would pedal into these triples or drop into the start hill and I'd like take it along the ride with me that evolved into more of the affirmation that reminder to just smile let it flow and remind myself you know you're extremely talented just let it happen um that is 
beautiful. And I'm just thinking right now, did you come up with this yourself? Or did you, I know you've talked about a few mentors and it sounds like you had amazing parents, but did you get taught any of these things from a psychologist or? I don't know where the fear in the pocket actually came from. Like I don't know back then. I was always listening to audio books and you know, pick up on different things here and there. There was a psychologist like through the Australian Institute of Sport. Yeah, I had different people, but I don't actually particularly remember like the person or the time frame or what worked. And I think sometimes like all these different tools will work, but that was one that stuck <laughs> and worked for me of how I needed to not fight that fear, but deal with it. Have you had a lot of, it seems like when you hear kind of the intro for this podcast and like everything we've talked about, we're talking about like how amazing, successful it sounds like. I mean, I know, I'm sure it hasn't been easy, but it sounds like, wow, it's just been like a lot of success. Have you had like disappointments and failures and how have you kind of dealt with them? Do you have some stuff about that that you kind of want to share with us? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was a lot of events that, yeah, I wouldn't win or I wouldn't successfully jump that jump or I would crash or I'd have injuries um when those things would happen I would obviously debrief with the people around me my friends my family like just get it out just vent just talk and then yeah obviously back to that little success recipe or back to my vision board or you know just like check back in afterwards because those are the times that when things don't go right it's what's the lesson or like how can you learn from this or how can you like recheck back in with where you want to go um it's really those losses which are the launching pad to the next success one of the biggest I think down to up in my career on the bike success wise was the 2012 London Olympics I think I'd I'd won the world title I was the national champion I was it was my first Olympics like I'd won the time trial, I'd won every lap, I'd won the semi-final, won the quarter, won the semi-final. So I was like, all right, like I've, I've got this. And I walked up to the gate and I remember I didn't have that belief in myself that in that final moment I could execute. And so I got up there and all of a sudden I'd been so focused all day on the process and it was like my vision opened up and I was like, oh, my God, David Beckham's staring back at me. The royal family's here. There's tens of thousands of people. Oh, my God. Like, I'm so nervous. And at that point, I had lane pick. Lane one's the inside advantage. You normally go lane one because that's the quickest inside route. And I remember thinking about my competitors. So all of a sudden, that all of this, you know, focus that I'd had went out the window. And, yeah, one of my competitor Sinead's Reed, she was the new Red Bull girl. She carried the flag for the country, like all these external huge things. And I remember painting a picture in my mind that, oh, she's going to win this. Like I'll give her lane one. I don't want to like get cut off by her. So I went back into this like state of like how can I, um, how do you word it? It's like when you're, offensive or defensive when you're trying to like score the goal or you're trying to protect the goal and all day I've been out there trying to score the goal be proactive and then all of a sudden I got up to that gate and I was like oh how can I stop this girl cutting me off or how can I make sure that this person doesn't interfere interfere in my race like it became external and I was all, all of a sudden trying to stop balls and you know defend so that was like this huge turning point and I chose the wrong lane. I chose lane three. I got cut off by the Colombian. The Colombian went on to win Mariana. Sinead's on the inside. I think she ended up choking as well, you could say. Um, yeah, and we didn't get the results we wanted. So I crossed the line in fifth and was like, wow. Like that whole moment in time was I needed to learn a lesson from that. And um, so that was – for me, it was that loss or that setback or whatever. And how I dealt with it was going into the next season. I wanted to <laughs> set this crazy goal. I was like, I want to be able to like handle more pressure, like those pressure cooker moments. And what am I actually capable of? So like strip away all these limiting beliefs. And I set a goal to win three world titles in 72 days in three different countries 
in three different energy systems. So it was downhill mountain biking in South Africa. It was all cross mountain biking in Italy. And it was BMX racing in New Zealand. 72 days apart, three different bikes, three different sports. And I trained a whole year for that. And went to the BMX Worlds in New Zealand. This was the year after the Olympics. So I hadn't competed against Chinese. I hadn't competed against Mariana. I hadn't been on that start gate with these girls since that failure moment in my life. And I got back up there and I won all day again. I was able to choose lane one. And one of the techniques that I brought from London to then the world title was just breathing into my uh, stomach, so like chi breathing. I'd had this um, chi breathing trainer help me with it. And all I would do was like roughly like three fingers below my belly button sort of distance. All I would do is focus on like breathing into that lower part of my stomach. And by controlling my breath and taking that emotion and like nerves and everything out of like my upper body and sending it back into my stomach and only focusing on that it would take away the distractions of the last time I failed or the Olympic moment or everyone I let down or whatever it was and I would just breathe I got in lane one I smiled I like looked at the crowd and um I dropped in and won that world title and so the difference of like controlling the emotion from the Olympics, learning from that failure, learning from that mistake, but taking a tool, which for me was literally breathing, and just focusing on my breath, that would calm me down. And so dropped in, won that world title, got on a plane, went to South Africa for the Downhill Worlds, placed fifth at the Downhill Worlds, then flew to the Four Cross World Championships and then won the Four Cross World title. So in this like calendar year, I'd gone from the Olympics to the next year winning two world titles in two different sports, making history, all this wildness that came with it, Australian Athlete of the Year, Cyclist of the Year, like sponsors, like you name it, like craziness. Um, but the difference was it was like I just controlled my breath. I just reminded myself that, you know, I needed to take away those limiting beliefs. I needed to not think about the girl that has the Red Bull deal, the girl that could potentially cut me off in the gate, not be defensive but come back into that real offensive mindset. Um, yeah. Wow. I feel like this story is so applicable to anyone at any age because any kid, like a nine-year-old, is going to go through the same things that you just went through, that through their head looking at other people. This is huge. And yeah. I love also, um, I mean – a disappointment like that at the Olympics, it's you really have two paths, right? You just, uh, <laughs> I love the path you chose. And that is literally the champion mindset that we're talking about. Um, yeah. It's so much less about the result, isn't it? It's so much more about like the personal growth journey, the person that you're becoming, the challenge. I just, I'm in awe that you just were like, okay, what else is possible? What can I do? <laughs> yeah. And then just, obviously like how I dealt with that is going to be different to everyone else and how they deal with a time in their life. But yeah, we're so much more capable than the barriers that we potentially put in ourselves, And that was that reminder for me. Um, it was also too, it was around that same time, it was the evolution of social media and the fact that you could put your goals out there and you could either keep them internal or you could throw them out to the world and people will help keep you accountable. It does open up the floodgates and these doors to if you don't succeed, maybe there's the negative feedback. But at the end of the day, most people, and this is what I've found, like I haven't really had trolls. I haven't had a lot of, I guess you could say, like hurt or bullying or not too much of that on my social media. And I think it's because I did quite early show the journey and I opened it up and said, these are my goals, what I want to do. Like I might fail. I might not win three world titles. I might win two. I might win none. I might choke again like I did at the last Olympics. But 
I'm going to throw it out there. And all of a sudden, like this community of people came together and so-called my followers, my fans now, um, they also helped to, I guess, yeah, be that positive driving force or that encouragement. Um, yeah, and why I think because I did show that and then when I had some major injuries in my life and then showed those major injuries and was out from the sport for two years, yeah, that you build this support network versus, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Total sense. Gosh, we have so many more questions. You've spent so much good time with us. Um, I kind of I kind of want to know, what's your take on champion? What does champion mean to you? I feel like you've already said a bunch of it, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> I love that champion creed. Like you can find it on Google if anyone wants to print that out. Um, I loved it growing up and it's quite instilled now. I think champions, like to me, the Lane Beachleys, the champions that have really helped my career and champions are those like modern day superheroes, but we're real. They're the real life people now that they're not only conquering for themselves, but they're conquering for everyone and for that next generation. So the times that I've had the struggles being a female in male dominated industry, you know, when boys were getting more prize money or, you know, all these like different hurdles now, I think, yeah, like, to use that and stem that as motivation and give back, I think that's where you can really like turn that driving force. So that was why like with my scholarship program for girls, be kind of next gen, it was, that was such a hard moment in my life, 14, 15, that I was like, I want to help give scholarships to some Aussie girls that want to go to the world championships. They want to perform on that global stage. Um, if I can sort of, help with that mentoring, give them a bit of financial support. It was $5,000 was a scholarship that would help them and their parents to go to the world titles and compete. So, yeah, that was sort of like why that stemmed um, to now. Just recently this week, it's brand evolved into Ignite, which is a new scholarship program I have. And it's, yeah, basically all around igniting girls' dreams. I've opened it up to... Australian girls for now, but it would be awesome if it goes global. Uh, 13 to 19 is the age bracket. So a lot more of a broad age bracket, BMX, mountain bike, and motocross. So any girl basically on two wheels riding dirt. Um, yeah, they can apply. And the question I've put through my website, carolynbuchanan.com, there's an Ignite drop down, there's Ignite on social media. Um, Basically, the question I ask them is like, where are you today and where do you want to be? And in this next four months, how can I potentially help to ignite your dream? And so now that there's not world titles, we can't travel. Some countries are in lockdown like Australia. Um, what, what can we do now to make this happen? So, yeah, some of the girls that have been putting in their scholarships already is like, a freestyle BMX girl, she wants to go to the next Olympics. So she wants an airbag that her and her parents can set up at the end of her street or down at the local soccer field so she can continue to practice. So that's like her submission of where the money is going to go and, you know, how we can ignite that dream. Um, yeah, and there's other ones like a backyard pump track dirt jump, sort of the mums agreed to um, bulldoze the landscaping in the yard and build this. So that's her ignite dream. <laughs> Yeah, so it's super fun and, like, I'll choose three girls in the next month to ignite that dream and that passion and, yeah, they get their content budget and I'll help them to find a videographer, you know, so the whole, like, thing of, yeah, bringing that ignite dream together. Oh, my gosh. You are just beautiful inside and out. And you are so in alignment with what our mission is with this podcast is just paying it forward and you can just hear the... I, you know, honestly, out of that whole from that whole talk, the thing that I thought you got the most excited about was talking about this um, scholarship. And it's just so cool to see where yeah. that's going to go. And I just oh, I have such big I can just imagine it's going to be amazing. So you have been so gracious with your time. We are so grateful for you. And um, Roe, did you have anything else? But we just want to say we're really grateful for you and so excited to keep following your career. 
Yeah, we're, uh, I have a feeling that your scholarship winners are going to be guests on the podcast one day. Just like yes. Lane, it's like this continued ripple effect. It started with Lane Beachley with you and it's just going to go on and on. I love it. Um, exactly. You guys follow Carolyn on Instagram, um, TikTok, and le- what else? Twitter. Facebook. She's on all those. Yep, and Facebook. Yeah. She's. <laughs> Carol, yeah. Oh, she's got an amazing YouTube channel, Carolyn Buchanan. The website, carolynebuchanan.com. Instagram's Carolyn Buchanan 68 right? Yeah, you can just search Carolyn Buchanan or it's C Buchanan 68 because my name's so long. I just oh. shortened it. <laughs> yep, that's right. But yeah, I'm okay. And I always get back to everyone that reaches out. So, yeah, reach out if you have any questions. And- that is true. I know that's the truth because I've got a bunch of little kids and parents that said, you've got to have Carolyn on the podcast. She answers my girl's questions. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's oh. very rare. You're wow. a gem. Thank you, you so are much. A gem. Oh, thank you. <laughs>